Good evening, Emily Garley. Thank you so much for being here tonight in La Repregunta, el especial. It's my pleasure. I would like to, to start asking you some questions regarding transmission. Because, for example, in the city of Buenos Aires, there was a, a, yes, a great debate when the mayor of the city decided to allow people to go to run in the parks. And there was a kind of, uh, well, critics, uh, because the runners, that uh, the way we call here in Argentina, mm -hmm could contagion, could transmit, could spread the virus to other neighborhoods, to other cities. Is um, coronavirus an airborne uh, virus? So I'm going to answer this question with a, in a long way. Yes, please. Um, so I think when we, when we think about transmission, we always have to be humble because this is a new disease and we're still learning a lot about how transmission happens. Because it's new, uh, first we have to begin with the theories of how this virus leaves our body and all of the possible ways it could come into contact with someone else and infect them. And we know that the virus is in our respiratory tract. So when we're running or breathing, if we're infected, we know that the virus is somewhere around there, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, there is some evidence that, uh, you know, the, your air particles, um, the, the particles that come out of your mouth can be around you, can stay for some time. We know from studies that they can find bits of the virus in those, in some of those samples around patients who are very sick in a hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, so this tells us that this kind of transmission is possible, right? Theoretically, it is possible. And so what we know is that the people who are being infected, the secondary cases from the careful studies that we have, shows that um, most of them are very close contacts of the case. They live together or they spent many hours together. They spend a lot of time together in an enclosed space. We don't have evidence that people outside, someone ran next mm -hmm. to you or someone uh, was even a short distance from you for a long time outside. We don't have evidence that transmission is happening that way. So it's a big difference between outdoors and indoor spaces and the amount of time you spend with a person with, with, who is infected. Absolutely. And how, how so it depends on many things, right? How close you are to them. Mm -hmm. It depends on the environment in the air around you. Outside is a very low risk environment for transmission. Okay. So let's imagine that uh, you have to decide between, um, well, sustain uh, a quarantine to keep a quarantine for many, many months, or to um, try to educate and train people uh, about how to keep a certain distance and how to move and handle uh, social life in public spaces. Which is the better option to deal with the, with the virus? Because when a quarantine here in Argentina, we will be 100 days of very strict quarantine in the city of Buenos Aires and surrounding neighborhoods. Yeah. Um, look, I, you know, I think political leaders are all making their decisions for certain reasons, and I don't want to speculate on this. But um, I think that uh, the, this quarantine, and I think by quarantine you mean really everyone staying home, right? This is, uh, everyone is limiting all of their contacts and, and everything, uh, yes. and life is coming to a stop, right? So this is uh, something that was done in many countries at the beginning, right? You're trying to get transmission down. We know it works very well for that. You're trying to get a handle on what's happening and you're trying to, at the same time, hopefully buy some time for the public health response so mm -hmm. that programs like surveillance, uh, contact tracing can ramp up. So while you're taking these measures to reduce transmission, the public health response is also building up so that at some point they meet and you can handle that public health response. So I think when you get to that place, 
it is time to, you know, to have uh, more measures in place. I, I think this kind of broad quarantine where everyone stays home, you have to do it until you have a better plan. Mm -hmm. But if your transmission is coming down uh, because of that, you know, you have it's 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 good. You have to find a way to to engage in life. And there are many things that you can do to stop transmission and to have a very good public health program to try to keep transmission low. For example? Um, yeah. So you already mentioned uh, physical distancing. Mm -hmm. So you have to find a way uh, for things to work where you still keep a physical distance. But for example, uh, if a bigger, if, if uh, the number of runners who go to the park to run, it is very big, or protesters go to the streets, as we have seen in the States, and we have seen here in Argentina last weekend because of economic reasons. Uh, these protesters, these runners, because of the amount is, and because the impossibility of keep the social distance, could be infected in these in this, uh, circumstances? Um, I think these are two very different issues, so let's deal with them separately. Please. So for runners, yeah, again, we don't have any evidence mm -hmm. of transmission in this way. Mm -hmm. Great. I'm not saying it could never happen, mm -hmm. but we, the evidence we have so far tells us that this is not important for transmission. Mm -hmm. And in the so case again, of we protesters? have to separate these things. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in the case of protesters, I, this to again, this totally depends. How long are you together? Uh, how far apart are you? It's, there is no uh, checkbox. Okay, this distance is safe. This distance is not safe, right? Mm -hmm. It's all a continuum. Uh, are people co wearing face coverings? That can be in those settings where you cannot physically distance from someone else. That can be really important. Mm -hmm. But again, outside... It's a there, it's much lower risk of transmission outside than inside. So we have to also separate that risk out. It's very interesting. I mean, so outside is safer than inside, but quarantine, Absolutely. a prolonged quarantine, is asking people to be at home, which is inside. So homes are home halls and homes are a place a dangerous place if someone is infected and is not knowing that it is that he is or she is infected. So um, staying at home, it, the idea is that you keep from getting infected and bringing the infection back to your house. So I think we have to clarify a little bit there. Um, so the idea is that you reduce the chances of infection in your home if everyone is trying to stay home as much as possible. Mm -hmm. If someone is infected in the home, then yes, that environment is a very high risk for transmission. Mm -hmm. That's where we see most transmission happening. And so that's why, you know, it doesn't, uh, you know, we have to focus on what we know first and what we know and we, all the evidence tells us this, the most important thing is to have a very good surveillance program so that anyone who is sick is getting a test, they're getting a test fast and they are isolating themselves so they don't spread to others, including in their household. And all of their contacts are quarantining because if they are, you know, those contacts are quarantining, then that means when they become infectious, if they're infected, in fact, then they won't be spreading it to other people before they know they're sick. So they, we can't talk about all of these things separately. We, the surveillance, finding cases, isolating and quarantining has to happen first. And that is way more important than who is running where. Mm -hmm. That is the most important thing that you have to assure first. And then you can think about these other um, activities that, okay, maybe there's some risk or maybe it's not, but that it's really a secondary issue compared to this one of finding cases, isolating them and quarantining contacts. The focus has to be on this first. Could you, do you think that just thinking of a quarantine without uh, doing a very careful process of tracing and isolation of the cases doesn't work. This is the idea that you are speaking is more systemic way of handling the pandemic, quarantine, but also contact tracing. One without the other is not working. Um. Uh, let me rephrase, let, let me just restate the question to make sure I've understood. Please. Uh, when you, so because when I use the word quarantine, so 
uh, I think we, we maybe we're using it in a bit of a different way. So we can also ask the contacts of a case to quarantine, which means they're healthy, but we're asking them to stay home anyway because they could be infectious before they get sick. Yes. Uh, sometimes we use the word quarantine for this, like everyone stay at home at the, on the yes, general population. Yes, this is the so way I'm... To... Yes, I am asking okay. you about this, and this okay. concept of quarantine. Okay. A general one, a, general, a social lockdown. Yeah, social lockdown. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so first, uh, regarding the point in China, it's really important for us to understand that the transmission of this disease and the prevention, the interventions that we have, all happen within a cultural context. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the important ways of transmission, um, you know, what is acceptable for people in terms of an intervention, this is going to vary from place to place. So we can learn about what happened in China, and that's really useful for us. Mm -hmm. But Uh, you have to know your own population. You have to work with them on what is the intervention and what is acceptable in your population. We know this from public health. You can't just take an intervention from another place and plug it in somewhere else and expect it to work. It all has to be adapted to the cultural context. Mm -hmm. So I would just make that point that this is, uh, you know, as you mentioned, they have some isolation procedures that wouldn't be feasible in all places. Uh, but they also wouldn't be acceptable in all places. Mm -hmm. And in some places, they may not be necessary. Yeah. So you have to think about um, where people live and how they live. Uh, is it possible for someone who's infected within a household to really isolate themselves within that household? Mm -hmm. In some places, it might be possible, right? Uh, so there's no need for this. Uh, but in some places, it just if it's impossible, um, then you have two options, okay? In China, it, this was the mandatory thing where you say, okay, you're infected, you're going here. Okay. Yes. Um, so that's not acceptable in, in many places. And, and as you mentioned, there are good reasons for this. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, there are some people who really uh, have concerns about uh, transmitting to someone in their house. And if they can't isolate there, can we give them the option to go somewhere else? Mm -hmm. Right. This is a different thing, and I, I think that's very important. If there is any way to provide options for people to isolate themselves from their family members, let's say you have uh, your mother is living with you and she's at very high risk, mm -hmm. and there's no way to isolate in your house, you might choose to go somewhere else because of that risk to her. It is clear, so, Emily. So this is the quarantine yeah. for the close contact of the infected person. So this is a quarantine, yeah. the, the standard uh, concept of quarantine. But what about the social lockdown for everybody uh, without knowing who is really uh, infected but uh, not showing symptoms, or we are, who is not um, infected at all, who has been infected and has no problem or we, we, get, we, we, yeah. we wish yeah. uh, could not have problems? So this kind of lockdown has huge costs socially, economically, uh, and, and in many other ways. And is it so effective? I, because let's say that we want to avoid deaf people. So we say we are going to pay this cost. We are, we are going to assume this cost. Yep. But is this effective to contain the epidemic or the pandemic? Uh, it is, if that is all that you have, Then you may then you accept those costs. Many places accepted those costs mm -hmm. to drive down transmission. So if you do it, yes. If you're truly not leaving your house and not having contact with other people, yeah. yes, transmission will go down, mm -hmm. of course. And this is what happened in many places. But uh, it's a very blunt tool, right? It, um, it's it's what you use when you don't have anything else. So it's not to say that it doesn't work, it works, but it's a, uh, it has other big costs and there are other more strategic ways to stop transmission if you can build up the public health workforce mm -hmm. for surveillance and contact tracing. Mm -hmm. uh, the curve in Argentina has showed that in spite of this prolonged, this very long quarantine, uh, lockdown, let's say lockdown, mm -hmm. 
uh, the okay. cases are beginning now, after almost 100 days of lockdown, to increase in a very worrying way for the, for the government, for politicians, for the people running the system, the political system and also the mm -hmm. health system. Um, this 100 days has been important for trying to adjust the um, health system and they succeeded at doing this by the increment exponential increase is beginning to well to occupy the the beds in the uh, intensive care units for example so if you mm -hmm. don't have a very careful system of tracing the only tool you have is the lockdown so you are the same a lockdown because the contact tracing system and teams are not uh, very robust very strong yeah and I think it's important to clarify here, right? Uh, a policy of strictly staying home is one thing. Uh, people's behavior can also be quite another thing, right? Yeah. And after some time, it becomes very difficult to always follow this. You know, there are certain things in life that you have to do. You can put off, you can put off, but sometimes... Uh, you know, it, these kinds of uh, very strict lockdowns become more and more difficult to follow. So there can also be over time, naturally, uh, that there is a waning uh, effectiveness of keeping everyone locked down at home. Mm -hmm. So you, there, it's, it's, there's no, it's, it's, a, it's a strategy to buy you time to ramp up the public health programs. Yeah. It's not an indefinite replacement for the robust public health response that you have to have in place mm -hmm. to keep transmission in check. And, and, I'm, and I'm not talking about stopping transmission. I'm talking about just keeping it at lower levels and doing what you can to reduce it. Very important, this clarification. Emily, you are in charge of, the, um, of training and educating uh, contact tracers in New York, uh, based in Johns Hopkins Bloomberg um, Health uh, School of Health, isn't it? So we... I'm the lead instructor for an online course yes. that was used to give basic training to people who would be hired to do contact tracing in New York State. Mm -hmm. So it was one step in their hiring and training program. But this uh, program is freely available to everyone and has been used now by many states here in the US and also adapted in many other countries. Uh, so it's a basics training, but hopefully something that public health departments can build on um, and to give them a head start and training and ramping up this workforce that they need. What should a contact tracer should know so as to, to be effective in, this, in doing this? Uh, contact tracing is a very, is very difficult work. Um, so uh, this is the first thing to realize. The course that we uh, put together has five, an introduction to five topics. One is how is the virus transmitted? What does this disease look like? How can we prevent it? Okay. The second is how does contact tracing work? So in theory, how does this stop the chains of transmission mm -hmm. to lower the transmission in the population? Third, we talk about just the basic steps of how contact tracing works. Fourth is the ethical considerations. And this is framed more about the US context, but mm -hmm. is applicable more broadly. And then finally, we talked about effective communication. So how do you talk to people? And importantly, how do you listen to people? Because contact tracers have to give information to people in a credible way, but they also have to get some information to do their job well. How do, so how it's do an they do this, this, Emily? How do they do this by uh, over the phone, or they go to ring the bell of their homes of the um, probably infected people and ring the bell of their homes? So again, you have to know your cultural context. There are mm -hmm. some places in the world where they are doing this by going door to door. Mm -hmm. People don't have phones, or there's no, they don't know the phone numbers. Okay, uh, in the United States right now, in most places, it's being done by phone. Uh, and that's for a number of reasons. But contact tracing isn't new. Health departments do this all the time for other outbreaks and for other diseases. It's just the scale and the speed that we have to do it for this disease is something new. Um, and as the 
pandemic changes, the way that we do contact tracing may also change. We have to be flexible in doing this. Um, but right now it's mostly by phone in the United States. Emily, let me challenge you uh, for the last question. <clears throat> in the New York Times, a period piece, the title was Contact Tracing is Harder Than It Sounds. And the main issue, uh, I'm sure that you, you probably read it, uh, says that just when a poster or an opinion poster or a census, a, a census um, public servant who is trying to get information for the census or people who is trying to send you to sell you something call to your telephone it is an unknown call and you see the number you tend to not to answer it there is a, a answer a rate of uh, six percent so how could you make how could you be succeed how could you succeed in containing the epidemic with this very low rate of answering a phone when the contact tracer is calling this person? So I think this is the question that all contact tracing programs have to answer within their own community, right? Because the answer won't be the same for every community. So in some places, the number isn't random. It says, this is the health department calling you. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, maybe you already know some the person that you had contact with and you know they're sick. Uh, this is not the same as trying to sell you something. So I think that analogy isn't quite right. Mm -hmm. uh, this is about your health. Um, I think many people understand that, you know, being notified that they've been exposed is really important for their health and the health of the people that they love the most. Mm -hmm. right? Who wants to infect their loved one? No one wants to do this. So yes. I think the analogy is not quite right. Okay. Um, but I, I do think that trust in public health programs is an issue. Mm -hmm. It's definitely an issue. It's not just up to the contact tracers themselves to solve this. They're the ambassadors of the problem. Yeah. But they're just facilitating contact tracing, right? The contact tracing works because we agree to isolate ourselves when we're sick and we agree to quarantine if we've been exposed. Mm -hmm. So it's something that the community has to do. So everyone in that community, from the elected officials to the community leaders, to religious leaders, to everyone has to be talking about this. And they have to be thinking about what is our strategy to keep ourselves safe, right? Yeah. It's not that someone else imposes on you. What is your strategy? And if it's not contact tracing, then what is it? Okay. I mean, this is, this is the best thing we have, so. Emily, the last question really now is you are in the United States facing different situations depending on the state, on each state. Some curves are going down, some curves are going up. But the uh, contagious is exponential. So is, um, in this case, uh, contact tracing is still the most effective tool when the contagious ex is exponential or you need a, lock a lockdown again? I, again, this is for every local community to decide, but if, let's just imagine, okay, your cases are going up and you have contact tracing in place. This is a clear signal that your contact tracing is not good enough ah. to contain the transmission, right? Mm -hmm. um, maybe, I mean, some places where, the, where transmission is going up and cases are going up exponentially didn't take the time to ramp up their contact tracing programs. They mm -hmm. didn't do it yet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so that's a that's a bit of a mess. It's hard to start the program when you're facing that situation. But um, any kind of contact tracing and any kind of uh, effort you can put in will ultimately lower the case counts, mm -hmm. right? Um, but again, we all have to be very humble. Mm -hmm, we don't yeah. have excellent examples in the U.S. of, oh, look, this place has done it and they've done it very well. So we have to be in a learning mode and we have to be very humble. We have mm -hmm. to try our hardest and then take the feedback. If we're not doing it well enough, then we have to change yeah. and see what we can do better. Because we, so, were, we are very surprised with the case of Chile, who has been running a contact tracing the, compared to other countries like Argentina, a more a stronger contact tracing system, but the cases are going up in a very worrying way. So there is a problem so, in the contact tracing system, you say. Well, it's not enough to keep it down. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, you, it's still, so I think we, you have to be a bit careful, right? So some people say, all right, with contact tracing, we still have transmission. So the contact tracing is not working. Mm -hmm. 
But the real comparison is what would the case counts be like if you didn't have this program, <laughs> right? Yes. They would probably be much higher. So I think we have to appreciate the work that is being done there. But we also have to be realistic. If it's still not enough to keep the transmission low enough so we don't see exponential transmission, then we have to keep adapting mm -hmm. and we have to keep growing and learning. Um, I think importantly, the contact tracing programs can also give us good information about how transmission is happening in that place. Oh, yes. So it's an important prevention tool, but it's an important learning tool. And we have to take advantage of that learning uh, on how to do better. Great. I think that uh, in many places, it's really the surveillance that is it still a bit inadequate. Not enough people are getting tested very quickly. Mm -hmm. And even if you're finding the contacts very quickly, if all the cases are detected late, you're always behind and lagging behind. Mm -hmm. So we have to be looking at the how many people we test and how quickly we can test them. Well, thank you so much, Emily Garley, for this very important consideration and explanations regarding the coronavirus pandemic. It was a pleasure. Thank you.